the premise here is that the way you experience death is changeable. That, um, that we are subject, as soon as we are born, we, we have death in us. Because as soon as this body, the cells came together with the sperm and the egg, this thing had a termination date. And that's the nature of this thing, of this realm within you, in the way we experience this realm. When you are in this realm, this is what death is. If you are not in this realm, that's not what death is. But we're in this realm. That is what death is. It starts when you start. And we feed it. We solidify it. It grows. It's like a thing inside us. Being afraid of it won't stop it. Ignoring it, putting it. I was talking about nursing homes. We, we hide the elderly. We don't want to see that terminate. We don't even talk about death in our culture. It doesn't exist. La, 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 la. <laughs> The problem with that is that when it comes, we are so gripped with fear because we don't understand it. Not only that, we have been ignoring it all this time. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. When you get your first serious illness, when you get your deepest loved one passing, you, you are forced to see it. And even then, even then, we then put on the blinkers again and like we get busy with the rest of stuff, even though it's growing inside us. You cannot escape it addressing things like the Large Hadron Collider externally to you. You have to put leather on your feet to address it. This, this will give you the code to switch that perception of death off in the way you see it. Hmm. So each day it grows and it grows, eventually it will get you. The six realms inside that which we'll cover in a second, the thing they have in common is that that monster's got them. Every insect you see, every living creature you see here must do these transitions. Life and death, and life and death, and coming and going and life. And you can even take that as a metaphor for mo small moments. I've fallen in love, out of love. I've got a great job, lost the job. It's cycles. Yeah? The, I love the iPhone, hate it. <laughs> I like iPhone 1, uh, iPhone 2, it died. <laughs> hmm. So, what I'd like you to do let me share with you something that uh, is coming in 2013. I made this promise a year ago, it didn't happen. I'm going to make another promise and see if it happens. <laughs> the idea is that if what we've just been talking can be used in your life and in your experience to shift something that can switch off suffering and turn on bliss, or any part of that, if that's possible, it's inside this painting, and hopefully I can transmit and share the information that I got from my teacher, Geshe Michael Roach, who got it from his teacher, Holy Ken Rinpoche, who came out of Tibet when it was bombed by the Chinese. He got the official education from the same teacher as the current Dalai Lama, Holy Trijan Rinpoche, who got his teachings from Pabonka Rinpoche in the 1920s, who got his teachings. And you can trace it back all the way back to when this thing was first printed to the Buddha. You can trace it, teacher to student, teacher to student. And as that information came forth, it wasn't just in books. It came forth this way, the way that I'm sharing it with you. So Ken Rinpoche sat in front of Geshe Michael, where he was over there, and he got this information and he turned it on to something real for him. Something that got him to have the experience of seeing the ultimate nature of reality. Depending on who you are, you can make the assumption, or if you've met Holy Ken Rinpoche 
you could say that the same was true for him. When he sat in front of Trijan Rinpoche, he got this verbally like you did, sure with text and information, but there's something that turned on in them and then they did something with it to shift their experience, their reality. There's no other way of making it real. No, no throwing books at you is going to shift it. You get this information, you make a shift in your view, you make a shift in your behavior, and then that must have a result. And if you're making the shift to something that's ultimately true, you're going to have an ultimately true shift. And if you make a shift in something that's nominally true, inside the wheel, pretend true, it's going to end. That's all this is simple. So I want to share with you that in 2013, I'm hoping to run an art project, myself and a bunch of other people, hopefully much more intelligent than me, who will get the ideas, these ideas that I'm sharing with you today, and share them with about 50 to 60 artists, some large artists and really well-known artists, and say, well, how do you get this idea of death and the way we see death? And once you understand the way we teach it and where it comes from and all that, you'll get more of a sense of it. How, what metaphors can we use in the West or in modern world to depict that? Or the 12 links of dependent origination. We'll ask 60 artists to say, you give me a rendition of what we use as a metaphor to make causality an experience in the West or in, the, in modern world. And then we see this machine, it's like pieces of a clock coming together and see if it can turn on the machine that kills death. Turn on the machine that destroys suffering. So the idea is that just like the painting has the four aerial truths, suffering, causes of suffering, there's a way out of suffering, there's a way to get there. Then this art exhibit produced by 60 modern thinkers who get, could internalize these ideas. What is death? How does it come? What causes? What are the three poisons? And we'll cover it. Will be experienced. So you'd walk into an art, to this art gallery, to this show that will be traveling hopefully, and you'll walk in and you might see 15 pieces of art, some audio visual, some painting, some sound, some performance, whatever it is, and you will walk in there and you will get the idea that, wow, this world has suffering in it. You, you get that inside you. And then you'd walk into another room and go, wow, these are the causes of suffering. I can see them. The, and we'll, we'll cover, you'll understand when we cover it. So then you get maybe 15 different interpretations that are relevant today. And we go, wow, in the West we think about that through psychology this way, through science this way, through philosophy that way, through modern media this way. But you walk out of that room having a sense, a real sense that the way we suffer is produced. And then you'd walk into another room and you'd go, I can turn off that production. Wow, I can actually switch off the causes of suffering. Because 15, 20 other artists might have produced work that lets you invoke that in you. When you see this painting or when you see this video, you go, there are opportunities right now in this world to turn off the causes of suffering. And then the last one, the fourth arrow to how to get that. So the idea is, I'm going to use you as guinea pigs, this sheet of paper. So do you get that? you get the project? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's coming. This sheet of paper, which is somewhere for you. I don't know. Who tested that? Yeah. Oh, Laurent. I'm going to ask you to send them back to me, and we can do copies later. I want to know if Mr. Death is the thing that has every being in this realm in common. What's your understanding of death? What's your deepest experience of death? This is your personal map to the code. And then at the end of the classes, we'll get to share out some of this and go, you know, my understanding of death is limited to this, or it has this depth in it. So I'll give you an example. When I was beginning to teach this thing, my father died. I had a very direct experience of death. For the first time in my life, somebody very close to me, and I saw him alive for an hour, and then he was dead. I had a, I had a way to experience death that I'd never experienced before. The, 
wonderfully horrible thing about it was that the old man looked exactly like me. Like, he really looks like me. I really look like him. And so I'm looking at this face that's very similar to the face I see every day in the mirror. And it's dead. It's pale. It's finished. It doesn't move. Lips are gone. Eyes are shut in an abnormal way. There's no hue. And so there's a deepening of the realization that I'm terminating. In fact, I left the room where he had passed. Actually, no, I, I didn't. That was the day after. I walked into the funeral home. I never had to do the whole funeral home thing. And it was in South America, so they had to keep the coffin open for 24 hours for everybody to have a look. And so I'm leaving him in that room. I turn around and there's this mirror that's the entire length of this wall. And I'm walking down and I, I see in that mirror that face that I just left. And I realize I'm the last one with that mask on this planet now. I'm next. And then my younger brother's probably after, if things go in synchronicity. So each of you have an experience or an understanding of death. And so I'm going to ask you two questions for you to write down in the space in there or to make a note somewhere in the back. What does death mean to you? And where do you think it comes from, really? Like, don't give me the right answer. Give me what your gut tells you. Don't give me what you learned in church unless you really believe that. And if you have some uncertainty about it, that's good. Because with uncertainty, you can break it. And that's the point. We're going to break it. So I want you to spend a minute or so just spending time meditating and write down the best thing that you can about your understanding of this thing. This is, don't forget, a map to a reality that we experience. You're coming closer to that thing. We all are in this realm. What does that mean to you? What's the closest you've touched that creature? That's a metaphor for what's happening inside you, according to the Buddhists. And it's a hard question, if you're honest. And then the second question is, where does it come from? Where do you think it comes from? That's an important question. What produces it? So I'll give you a minute to write down uh, your personal answer. You don't have to share it if you don't want to, but I think to make this class practical, I'm going to ask that question of every one of the segments. And it's important here, uh, because then if you do share it, then we can tell the artists, Hey, maybe the metaphor is this. Or the metaphor is that. Um, what does it mean? Yeah, but when you say you, you're going to die, okay. what comes up for you? What does that mean? Do you close up with fear? Do you go, oh, I'm excited? Do, you know? Like, what does it mean? Okay. And then where do you think that comes from? Sorry if I'm being too bad. It's more concept. Whatever it is that comes up, <laughs> to write something, because I'll, the class is meaningful only if this information gets into your DNA. And the only way to get it into your DNA is for you to do your half of the equation, which is get involved. It's a really good thing. If you feel uncomfortable, then you're a little bit of a weirdo.
more real you make these notes to yourself, the more the impact will be on your psyche. It's like you just throw one or two seeds on the ground or you throw a hundred seeds on fertile ground, you'll have a very different result five years later. Another forest or just a couple of trees. you've not done a death meditation before, you, you imagine what it's like to be present at your own death and you look through your eyes and you see everybody freaking out around you. Maybe you're in your deathbed and you imagine what, what are you perceiving as they come at you trying to touch you or console you, but you know in their faces they, they know it's finished. They're trying to smile and you feel the fingertips getting cold you begin to perceive that one of these breaths will be the last one. But you can't move your arms. And like that. When you step into that space, you get the invocation of what, what you really think about death. The first time I, I did that, it was frightening. The more you do that, the less a hold that fear has on you because you've practiced dying. There's a whole practice around that. that. This is not the class, but there's a practice to see this thing, this monster, this metaphor for what it is that grows inside us and how to how to stand up to it. In fact, there is. Um, no, I can't do that. So now I want to talk to you about the bardo. We're breaking down the components of the wheel a little bit more, and then we'll go back into death and bardo and so on. So I don't know if you can tell, I'm giving you a layer. I gave you the big picture. Now we're going slightly deeper, and then we're going right into death, okay? So I don't need to know what you wrote down. I just want that for yourself for tonight to, to have in your mind. Um, the bardo, let me ask you this. What do you think happens to you when you die? What happens to who, who you are? Like, we all have a very different idea, and some of us don't have an idea. What do you truly believe? I mean, there's no way of knowing, right? We're in this planet, we don't know. I don't know. But there are some things you can deduce with logic and investigating what happens to you, that thing that is you? And I, I want to premise that by saying you are two things. You are the physical you, the body that is you, the hair that is you. And that thing is changing so much that you are nothing like the five-year-old you. So you couldn't have been that you if you're this you, physically. And when you're the older you, you couldn't ever have been this you. So which you are you, physically? And then there is the perception of that you, the mental thing that perceives I am, I, I is this skin. That, the, the, the two aspects of you. What happens to the body you? What happens to the mental you? I want to ask you in that thing. The bardo is called the intermediate stage. The time between here and rebirth. Oops, did I jump too far? Mm -hmm. oh, the consciousness that continues, assuming you went to the Proof of Future Lives course, 12 classes on proving why they possibly could be a future life. What happens, what do you think happens when you pass? When the last breath comes out of this body, what happens to this energy, the perceptions that have got in there? Like since birth, you've had perception upon perception upon perception upon perception. Where do you think those perceptions go? Like the mind is racing at exactly the same speed that it's raced its entire life in this body. 
I like this, I don't like this, I want that, I don't want that, I don't like this, this is scaring me, oh, my, my mum's crying in front of me, oh no, I can't breathe. But the chatter, the experience is occurring as fast as when you're born. That's the mental. The body is doing another thing. We know what happens to that. It goes in the ground and it turns into food. But your mind, where does that go? So I'm going to ask you, can you write that somewhere in there? Um, the idea here is that there are two forces. I'll, I'll sh actually, yeah, I'll share that now. There are two forces that occur. The teaching is that after the mind separates from the body, there's two different energies dependent on, everything is causation, dependent upon the kind of energies that you've habituated throughout this life. So the energies, the, the pool of energies that you've habituated, the perceptions, the direction of your life, if it's black, it's a downward spiral that you'll have a, what they call a lower rebirth, you will, con your, your consciousness will continue but begin to experience things in a darker way because you've habituated greed or want or hatred or these things. If you've become that kind of old dude or do this, that's the main energy pushing you forward. Then in the Vardo, the in-between realm, they say it takes up to 49 days, that you go into seven cycles of seven days where your consciousness tries to continue that energy of being, that we want to be, and then after seven days you're like, I don't have a body, I'm in this in-between stage, and you reset, and like, I want to be. And the idea is, the Buddha and other beings have had a direct perception of that, and that's where these teachings come from. Say, so, well, this is what happens when you, when you die, with your mind. And you can have up to seven cycles of seven, where you're trying to be. The energy that is your consciousness pushing forward is trying to be. And if the being is darker, if you've spent all your life wanting me for me, well, then the energy will be dark. And you begin to see the creation of a semi-physical body. It's like you get to see a, a perception of a body, of the kind of body you will be born into, or born in, or perceive yourself born into. So if you enter, if your consciousness leaves the human realm and you have a shift of perception, in the barter, in the in-between stage, you begin to have a consciousness that this thing is no longer an arm, but it looks more like a paw. It looks more like, it, you begin to have a shape of what that thing that you will be coming. That's what they say in the barter realm is. Or the white side is the opposite. If your energies have been to the positive, to the growing, to the beneficial, to the goodness, to the pleasant, then your self-propelling forward direction is a positive a happiness, a better rebirth, they say. That would be the tough one. Yeah. I don't know who is that. So they say that, and recently, about 15 years ago, a sutra, an old sutra was found, that they found that the bardo drawing, one of the oldest, the original one, had a third color, a yellow color, which instead of saying dark and light, it's transition from human to human, rebirth. Does that make sense? And I want to talk a little bit about rebirth, just, I know we did the whole course, and it's not like your soul or your mind comes out of this body and then it goes floating somewhere in semi-heaven and then there's a dog and you go inside the dog <laughs> and then you're a dog. It's not, that's not correct, right? It's, we, and we have this, I did anyway, this weird perception that somehow you're stuffed into the body of that future creation. It is way more subtle than that, and there is feel, I mean, you could study for years the idea of rebirth and the understanding of how causation, karma upon emptiness, which we'll cover later, produces an experience of being locked into a human realm 
from birth to death, or being locked into an animal realm, seeing your experiences like that of a dog walking around, it's the same place. Those experiences do not exist in the place. They exist in the consciousness of those beings. So as many beings as we have here, dogs and cats and elephants and bats and girls and boys and old people, and everybody having a very different perception of the same objects, the same reality, that does not come from anywhere in that reality. And yet we feel trapped, we're forced to be seeing the world that way. That comes from us. And the shift in perceptions that occur from moment to moment are huge shifts in perception that occur between animal and human in this realm. They are produced. You can, if you know what caused the animal projections or the human projections, recreate them. And if they are shiftable about the same reality, you can create a perfect Buddha outside the realm perception of this experience. The fact that things change, the, thing, the fact that things are changeable, the fact that we disagree about the world means we can experience an again different world. Does that make some sense? The potential is available to us and yet we have habituated, we are forced to habituate a human experience of this realm and we think that's truth. The fact that there's a dog here looking at all this stuff going, this is weird, and nothing like I see it, means that there's two ways of interpreting this truth. If there's two, there could be five. And if it's locked in, something is causing the locked in, they could be unlocking. So rebirth is not so much your mind goes out of this thing that's true and shoved into the butt of the dog and all of a sudden you're a <laughs> dog. It's a shift in perception just like a shift in perception occurs from a moment where you thought things were this way, something communicates to you something differently and all of a sudden your entire existence shifted. The closest I can tell you about that as a real thing that we've all shared is the loss of your virginity. Before you had sex, you had an idea of what that was like and that was real to you. As a teenage, we all fantasized before having sex what it would be like and how it would be magical and there'd be people singing and it was terrible. It was, <laughs> it was just horrible. Anyway, <laughs> it was really depressing. <laughs> and it wasn't anything like I imagined. Yeah? Something occurred that millisecond that completely shifted my experience of sex. For all of us, that's true. Hopefully yours was much nicer. Yeah? Mine, we both started crying, it didn't work, it was just terrible. <laughs> yeah? Her parents were coming home soon and she like, ran away. Um, what I'm saying is that something causes the shift in perception and you were certain the world was just this way until a millisecond something happened. And from that millisecond on, the world was entirely a different thing. And that is available to us all the time about everything. In fact, it happens to us constantly. The lover we had that was the most amazing, lovable person is the most horrible bastard on earth. In a millisecond. They're not changing out there. You're removing your leather feet. Something's shifting in you. Death is the same. The bardo realm is the same. The energies down and up are the same. We'll cover that in more detail so I don't run over. So then I want to cover with you the six realms. Oh no, I didn't get you to, to write down. Can you write down what you think happens to you when the eyes close for the last time on this planet? Where do you, where does your mind, con all the energies of your mind continue? Or do they? Well, I don't know what you believe. If you write... After what you say, it looks like yeah, but that's after what I said. I, I've asked you what you truly believe. What did you? What's your prejudice? We all have a belief about it. I'll give you a minute for that. Then we'll talk about the six realms or five.
Any questions, by the way? What was the question again? <laughs> the question is what the question was? <laughs> okay. Please answer the question. That we really don't. So exactly what we did about death. What do you think happens to you after you die? In the Bardo space, write down or point to it and go, really this is what I this is the best knowledge I have about that hidden reality. That's all I'm asking you. I'm asking you to say, what do you really believe? It's worth investigating. And you it's better investigating it now when we're thinking about these subjects than tomorrow when you're distracted with the iPhone 5. <laughs> Good question. Uh, they're humans going into demigods. Yeah? yeah. So it's going up. Yeah, so the white ones are energies pulling you up, the black ones are energies pulling you down. So good karmas, bad karmas. If you have. Spiral? Huh? Doing spiral, going down, and then. Going up, down, and then going up. Doing spiral, and doom spiral. Boom and doom? Doom spiral. I don't know what you're talking about. You're weird. No. <laughs> Did you say boom? Boom spiral. I've never heard of that. Things are going up, up, up. Oh, it's a boom spiral. Not quite, because you're still locked in samsara. Samsara. Yep. So it feels temporarily nice. Temporarily Yep. part of the wheel so again we'll cover all these things in more depth in classes two and three but today I want to cover nearly all of the wheel at this level so you get an impression of what's to come and where all the other teachings explain this also what it means to you because that, that's the only way it's going to help you that's the only way you can be <coughs> like King Udrayana a person who looks at this painting and that thing gets turned on in you that says I've figured out the code. It means something to you. Most people look at this painting and they're just shapes and colors. We're building in you a connection through this to have a decoder in your mind. So when you look at the painting, that thing gets turned on by King Kudrayana. And you can be another victim of the thing that killed death. That's the point. Okay. So the six realms for those of you who so these are in the clutches of death everything here has an ending beginning and an end beginning and an end starts and goes birth and death and the first one and this is backwards compared to that one and there are a few variations of the way the wheel is painted but these are the pleasure beings or the god realms and demigods you know this debate about whether it's a metaphor or they're really sitting somewhere in, in a spacey, lofty place. But the, the idea is that these are total pleasure beings, that these beings born in this realm, still in the clutches of death, have had so much good karma or well-developed energies inside of them that they can only experience beautiful bliss, loveliness, peace, perfect, like, like we, like we are in the West, compared to the rest of the world, we are like maybe a 1% or a 5% of the world's population that has water that you can turn on a tap and it feels lovely on your body. We take it for granted. But you grab the 7 billion beings on the planet and pitch them against your circumstances and you begin with, can I drink? Do I have a place to sleep? Do I have clothes? Do I have friends? Am I deeply sick? Do I get access to medicine? 
you'll have money in the bank. You start counting those things and all of a sudden you rise up at the top of this pyramid like the gods and demigods in this painting. Some people say it's a metaphor for us in this very fortunate existence we find. Other people say, no, you actually have a body that's beautiful that's not in this realm. The painting says it's not human. It's demigod and god. Different kind of bodies. But still produced by karma. Ignorant karma that is locked in the cycle of birth and rebirth. So the idea is that these beings live up to 500 years, equivalent to ours. This is a direct perception from the stories from the Buddha. And they are using storehouse upon storehouse of all the goodness that they've built over lifetimes. If life after life after life you do beautiful practices and beautiful things that produce all the goodnesses you experience as a god or demigod, you live a stretch of 500 years or more in total bliss. Don't even, it's not a body like this, it's a completely different body. And then towards the end of that time, because you're still locked in cause and effect, they're still locked in thinking they're truly that thing. And because everything's pleasure, there's not much need to do goodness, to replenish the goodness that produced that. So as the storehouse of goodness is used up, their consciousness is only left with the dark seeds from before. And they dive completely down to the lowest hells, is the idea. So they are still locked in the cycle of good and bad, black and white. And, and they are subject to the same laws of Mr. Death. The next realm I want to talk about is the human realm. And in this painting, the gods and demigods is the top right hand quadrant. The human realm is the one on the right. Okay. Yeah. And the conditions of the human realm is such a balance of suffering and goodness that we, whatever good we get, we lose very <coughs> quickly, it forces us to look for why. Whereas in the demigod realms, they only hear of their impending death a few days beforehand and they begin to stink and all the other god beings sort of move away from them and say something's wrong with that one and then they die. In our realm, it, it is fairly blatant, the balance between good conditions and horrific conditions, suffering and pleasure. It's like we have enough of a sting that we want to figure it out, that we want to practice something to make it better. We might be ignorant about what to do to make it better, like spend $10 billion on the large echo collider. Or we might look inside with leather shoes. But we have this want because we get a taste of what it's like to be content and then it disappears in our hands like autumn leaves fairly quickly and if you've lived long enough it happens over and over again to the point where you get fed up and you go I need to figure it out so they say that the human realm is the best place to practice the next realm described and they're all describing the same condition the next realm is the animal realm Senora. no it depends on the wheel so see this one the God realm is at the top there, the human realm is there. What about types? Uh, uh, oh, good question. What? Just put God realm on the heading and then you'll know. Okay. <laughs> I don't, yeah, sorry, good question. Well, she said, where about in here, you know? Mm. Yeah, which is good. Because I'm showing you something that's different there and there. And that's, that's fair. And so the animal realm, the conditions there Mostly, I mean, we, they still, everyone still goes through birth, aging, sickness, and dying. Yeah, those conditions are consistent on all these realms. The animals do it too, humans do it too. Uh, uh, God realms are birthed. But there's a different locked in reality from a human perspective, we think things are this way, and animals think things are this way, right? The predominant thing about all, all beings is we just want food and sex, 
Yeah, we just want to eat, 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 and reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. Animals too, humans too. The difference between, like we've got time to philosophize and figure out where things come from. Animals, if you consider their existence, are just food for other big animals. And so they're jittery and they're running away from being eaten. Or they're running towards something to eat. And that's what drives them mostly. Yeah, it, it, we imagine, like thanks to Disney, that, you know, butterflies are happy. Like, they, 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 a bird will eat them. <laughs> you know, happy little turkey birds and hummingbirds are, they're nervous, <laughs> they're scared, you know? So the animal realm is either chasing some other moving thing for food because you're hungry, or being the food for some other big thing. And it's not that animals, that it's, it's weird how we perceive animals. They are having an experience that is their reality. I'm saying like, you think this is your reality? Imagine being locked into a creature that thinks you're something's chasing you to eat you. That's all they have. So that's that realm. And then you have, these realms we can't see, we can talk about where they come from, etc. But they're called the craving spirits or the praetor realms or the hungry ghost realms. And there's another way of perceiving this reality. The bodies they have are not seen by us. And predominantly they are in the, in the lower birth than the human birth. Because they're predominantly plagued with suffering. They are forever craving. They are forever wanting. It's the energy that we produce by wanting and craving and chasing after things. Animal or human grown into a uh, locked in reality so the craving spirits will see food and as soon as they get to touch it it turns into shit or they'll see the liquid and they'll think they want to eat it and they're thirsty and they get to it and it's vomit or some revolting thing so they're forever dissatisfied they're forever craving they forever see a promise of something it's the growth of an energy that we all have animals and humans to to be this kind of glutton, obsessive, I want, I take, I want, I take. If you only habituate that in your stream of consciousness, what kind of forest would that create? If you're only seeding that thing in your consciousness, this is what it would create. A whole existence from birth to death as a craving thing that can never be satisfied, can't be noticed, can't be seen. Whatever it touches turns to horridness. It's just another extreme from the demigods. We have a nice balance. And then uh, you have the the hell realms. And you know, this disturbed me a little when I first read it because I moved away from being a Catholic and then I come to the Buddhist and I'm like, great, they've got hells. <laughs> these hells are worse. <laughs> these, these are wor worse and I, hopefully I get to cover them in the next few classes. I, I just want to leave you with, with I'm going to leave you with hell. No. I want to <laughs> think about it. If, if your mind is nothing but the experience locked into a reality, forced on you, of whatever your mind has been habituated to before. And that's true in this life. In other words, if you're a filmmaker and you look at images as film, or possible storylines and you habituate that over 20 years of being a filmmaker whenever somebody tells you a story when you're 60 you're thinking about how that looks like in a film or when you're watching a film you're only deconstructing the sound and the images and whatever your mind has been habituated to experience the world in a certain way my teacher Nisha Michael was a diamond dealer and a diamond person for years so he says that when he walks into a bus or he sees a person, he notices people, we might notice jewelry, he will notice what kind of diamond they've got, this type of diamond or that kind of thing. So your mind is habituated into whatever thing you're doing. And if you tend to see the world pessimistically, the older you get, the more pessimistic you're gonna see it. If you, if you tend to see beautiful and butterflies and Disney birds, then you're probably gonna see more of that. When you wanna buy a red car, all of a sudden the red cars appear everywhere. If that's true just in this life, and then you have life after life after life, 
those energies get bigger. And so the darker your experiences are here, the more that they can produce the seeds to force your experiences out of a hell realm of complete suffering all the time, from waking to dying. There are, and there are descriptions of, I don't know how many hells there are. It's worse than Dante, Dante's Inferno, the description of the hell realms in here. They are horrific, being chopped up. As soon as you wake up, someone's bashing you, you die. As soon as you wake up, someone's bashing you, you die. You need to do that so many times. The descriptions in these realms are horrific. I don't want to go into them. But if we've opened up the realm of possibilities to say the way we experience the world is not locked in, there are infinite possibilities of being. And within those possibilities, here are five realms or six ways that you can divide those infinite possibilities. But they are all still locked in suffering. To get out of that, there's yet another reality you can step into, and that's freedom from all these things. And that's, um, and that's the Buddha at the top, that Buddha. Free from suffering, nirvana. That's possible. So this gives you a quick summary of what's in the wheel and we'll cover the core next week, the thing that hubs and turns the wheel, the three poisons, and why it produces suffering and why you can stop it. And then we'll also look at dependent origination, the 12 links that produce this kind of locked-in perception, and see if we can put a spanner in the part of the cog that produces suffering. That's the goal of the next class. Thank you so much for coming. We have a... you have an announcement? I have. Yeah? So, like... <laughs> this is Mike, everyone. I have a story that I remember Geshe Michael talking about that relates to this, but I don't know if he, he talked about it in this class. Sure, sure. So maybe you remember the story. Okay, he's on an airplane. Oh, yes. And then looking to land, and the pilot announces that the landing gear won't go down. So we're going to have to crash land. Right? Yeah. So it seems though everybody's worried, right? Everybody's afraid or whatever. But a lot of people are helping other people, supporting other people, right? So these are people who are have this tendency to habituate the positive, and so positive. they take care of others, love yeah. and yeah. support of others, right? And of course, there were those who were just selfish <laughs> to themselves and yeah. right. it's totally only afraid and yeah. you know like that. So I, I guess Geshe Michael was on the positive side, compassionate side, which makes me think of uh, something else. Uh, we as Dharma students come here and we're happy to get these lectures from Hector and other good people. And we shouldn't like take it for granted. It's a great good karma that we have and we should try to provide that karma for others in the future. I was at a, a Dharma Center yesterday, I think, and I paid twenty dollars to get in to hear something and I think if, if you remember you paid ten dollars to get in instead of twenty or something like that. And we don't have that problem because a lot of us are generous and we put money in the or whatever. But we have this online dollar a day thing. And that's thirty dollars a month is that half a cup of coffee a day. <laughs> and somebody, I think there's one person that gives a little more than a dollar a day, maybe a full cup of coffee a day. <laughs> so guess how many I looked recently, maybe I, I looked at it wrong, but eight people joined. And we have classes here, like 50 people, twice a week. And, and if we want to provide for others in the future, the best thing that we could give them is dollar. Then we should join the dollar. <laughs> no, no, I encourage it, because it's true. We, we don't ask for money. This place is given to us for free. So um, whatever you could do, and the dollar a day is a nice thing, if you're regular and you want to come. Yeah, or throw some money in the bowl. Or throw some money in the bowl, that'd be lovely. And dedicate it to someone else who isn't here, that you know could benefit from the thing that you've come to seek. Imagine that if, by putting that back or whatever it is, you know, your mom or your best friend or whoever needs this thing, whoever yeah, yeah, yeah. in your life uh, gets that benefit. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you, Mike. I always forget to <laughs> encourage. Thank you. So we, we have this thing at the end. Yep. I have two quick announcements. Two Allison quick announcements. asked me to make one. Yep. 
Um, Divine Creativity Part 2 is happening Mondays beginning September 20, 24th from 7 to 8.30. Um, it's an ongoing discussion of hands-on creative practice involving object, object perception and arrangements. Um, and you don't need to be an artist to, you know, to join that. And then the other thing, Missy had asked me to make an announcement. Oh, on Facebook, or there's a link on Facebook that Javier is raising funds for the 108 documentary that's going to happen. A bunch of us are leaving for Nepal in three weeks. And um, there's going to be a documentary after, or document, yeah, that kind of thing, afterwards. So if you'd like to... <laughs> um, yeah, document. <laughs> All right. If you'd like to contribute to that, um, on the 108 Facebook page, there's a link to um, to that. And he's just collecting money, or he's collecting donations up until the time we leave. So yeah, be part of it without having to be part of it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more thing we do is we, whatever good thoughts you put through your consciousness today, including the depressive ones that say, well, the reality we live in a, is quite harsh. At least you have a conscious awareness of it now. Most of us are walking blindly through this planet, hoping that thing doesn't get us. And those people are walking outside the street today. Not many people spend time thinking about these things. Thinking about them is a goodness, because you're trying to fix it. The idea here is that you build up some of that energy inside of you, dedicate it, give it away, because that will cause more of that. It's sort of a selfish good thing. Uh, dedicate it, give it away to as many beings as you can imagine that need this in your world. Understanding a better, a better understanding about where their life comes from, their life problems and their life happinesses. That's what we're investigating. If the claims for this magical painting is true, and you can get some understanding on how to stop suffering and kill death and never perceive it in the same way again. It doesn't exist that way from its own side. Then give it away to someone. So that's this is the last, uh, this is the dedication that solidifies the karma inside of you. <laughs> some understanding of their reality in a way that can truly help them and that their lives are changed towards the positive as a result. So you see them affected positively from having received something that you just sent them, as many as you can imagine across the planet. And thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah for giving me the opportunity to blah blah about something that is ultimately, ultimately important for me. Thank you.